Welcome to Voice of the Vatican, our top stories. 40 Days for Life, saving lives through the power of prayer and fasting. The campaign kicks off, which has already saved nearly 12,000 lives of the innocent. Papal Ambassadors, a gathering in Rome brings together the Pope's representatives from countries around the world. March for the Family, more than one million people take to the streets in 125 cities of Mexico and marches to protect authentic marriage. Standing for Life, Cardinal Timothy Dolan releases a statement denouncing Catholics for choice, an abortion advocacy group masquerading as Catholic. A synod. The Chaldean Church holds a special synod to discuss the exodus of Christians in the Middle East, the martyrs to be beatified, and how to serve communities of the diaspora. For love of the family. The African Regional Conference on Families took place in Nairobi to discuss the pressures on families and how to protect them. A composition for the Lord. We'll speak to Father Mark Baumgarten of the Archdiocese of Perth regarding a song he composed about his own vocation that's touching the hearts of many. I'm Ashley Norona in Rome, Italy, and you're watching Voice of the Vatican, only on Shalom World TV. The cause is the saving of lives of the defenseless, and the campaign kicks off on September 28th. 40 Days for Life is the largest internationally coordinated pro-life mobilization in history, helping people in local communities end the injustice of abortion through prayer and fasting, through community outreach and peaceful vigil. Voice of the Vatican spoke to Robert Calhoun, International Outreach Director of 40 Days for Life, for more on this worldwide campaign. Uh, we encourage Christians to pray and fast for an end to abortion. We have a peaceful vigil outside an abortion centre for 12 hours a day. And we also do community outreach, taking a positive and upbeat pro-life message to all parts of the community. So we encourage Christians to get involved, to pray outside the places where abortion is happening in their local community. And it's a wonderful campaign. We've seen more than 11,000 lives saved from abortion as a result of our initiative. More than 675,000 people have got involved for the very, very first time. And also we've seen over 100 abortion workers leave and over 70 abortion centers close as a result. The inspiration began with a group of people who wanted to do more. It started in Bryan College Station, Texas in 2004. A group of individuals felt really frustrated that nothing was uh, happening in their local community. An abortion center just started and opened there. They tried everything to stop that center opening, but um, they got together, they prayed together, just four people around a wooden table. And the idea of a 40-day campaign inspired by scripture came to them, and they started a first 24-hour uh, initiative praying for an end to abortion. So from that very first initiative, abortion rate went down 28% in their city so uh, it really had a huge impact and then people from all around America became inspired from that message and wanted to conduct a similar campaign. Since then thousands of individual campaigns have taken place in 32 nations in 501 cities. We've got Slovakia and Sweden who are going to sign up for new campaigns as well. Uh, in Colombia we now have 20 cities involved in this initiative. In Croatia we now have 20 cities as well so uh, we're in this for the long term and in Texas we've seen uh, a lot of abortion centers close. Uh, they now have just 11 abortion centers in the whole state. So, so that's right, we're turning to God in prayer. That's where we see hearts and minds change. That's the whole point of 40 Days for Life. As a result, 50 abortion facilities have completely shut down following local 40 Days for Life campaigns. It was one of these campaigns that inspired Robert's work. I was in Canada and I saw a local uh, prayer vigil outside the abortion center in Ottawa, the capital. And I was very, very inspired. I felt God was calling me to start a campaign in London, England. Um, and I took the courage, I took a step of faith, went out of my comfort zone. We started praying in, in London 
Uh, we saw six babies saved from our very first campaign. Uh, we've now seen several hundred women impacted, several hundred women choose life for their babies as a result of our campaign. As a result of prayer campaigns, 101 abortion workers have quit their jobs and walked away from the abortion industry. Reports document 11,796 lives that have been spared from abortion, and those are just the ones they know about. In the U.S., 40 Days for Life is sponsoring a 40-day tour that will travel to all 50 states. The first rally will be on September 27th in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, echoing the words of Pope Francis, the right to life is the very first amongst human rights. You can find a stop near you at 40daysforlife.com. 106 papal representatives from around the world gathered in Rome for three days for discussions on important global topics. Mostly apostolic nuncios with episcopal rank, five were prelates who performed the mission of permanent observer at various international bodies, like the UN. These bishops serve as the official representatives of the Holy Father in various countries of the world. At the conclusion, the nuncios issued a pressing appeal to world leaders to, quote, work harder and more effectively to stop violence and find peaceful solutions to conflicts in various parts of the world. The bishops also expressed solidarity for all innocent victims and for those who suffer discrimination and persecution because of their religious faith. In an address, Pope Francis stated, You are the link between the successor of Peter and the various local churches, which are vital nourishment for the life of the church and for the proclamation of God's message. The Pope said Annuncio must meet, listen, talk, share, propose, and work together, showing sincere love, sympathy, and empathy with the people and with the local church. The Holy Father hoped their diplomatic service would be the attentive and clear gaze of the successor of Peter upon the church and the world. On a single day, cities throughout the country of Mexico saw more than one million people marching to preserve the authentic meaning of marriage. The marches were organized by the National Front for the Family, and a response to President Enrique Peña Nieto calling to change the Mexican Constitution to welcome so-called marriage that is between two men or two women. So-called same-sex marriage is currently legal in Mexico City and across a handful of Mexican states. Rallies were held in 122 cities across the country. A spokesman for the Archdiocese of Mexico City has said that the president's proposal felt like a terrible stab in the back to the Catholic hierarchy, with whom he had previously had a good relationship. Another national march is taking place on September 24th. Pope Francis has called marriage the vital cell of our society and told couples to defend God's design for the family as the union of a man and a woman. Cardinal Timothy Dolan of New York in the United States has made a public statement calling the abortion advocacy group Catholics for Choice deceptive and clarifying that it's no way affiliated with the Catholic Church. Dolan's statement came after the group placed full-page newspaper ads in multiple U.S. cities calling for taxpayer funding of abortion in the name of the Catholic faith. Dolan wrote, quote, as the U.S. Catholic bishops have stated for many years, the use of the name Catholic as a platform to promote the taking of innocent human life is offensive, not only to Catholics, but to all who expect honesty and forthrightness in public discourse. This organization rejects and distorts Catholic social teaching. Catholic social teaching expresses that abortion is a violation of social justice, as it kills the innocent and denies the human dignity which every person has. From September 21st to 28th, the Synod of the Chaldean Church is being held in Erbil, capital of the autonomous region of Iraqi Kurdistan. Of the many topics for discussion, the beatification of the Chaldean martyrs of the Assyrian Chaldean genocide, which took place a century ago in the territories of the current Turkey, which also included three bishops. Bishops will also discuss the most recent martyrs, Bishop Rahid Aziz Ghani, Sister Cecilia Moshihana, and Archbishop Paulos Faraj Rano, who led the Arch Patriarch of Mosul in 2008. They'll focus on pastoral and charitable interventions for the displaced, 
The phenomenon of the immigration of Christians and the choice of the new Chaldean bishop for the Diocese of St. Peter the Apostle in San Diego in the U.S. They'll also discuss the liturgical renewal and the future of the Nineveh Plain. Chaldean Patriarch Luis Rafael I issued a statement calling the Chaldean faithful around the world to pray to the Lord to enlighten the Synodal Fathers and to help them carry out fruitful work. Let us join the faithful in that prayer request for Christians who Pope Benedict XVI said are experiencing in their own flesh the dramatic consequences of an enduring conflict and now live in a fragile and delicate political situation. The Chaldean Catholic Church presently comprises around 500,000 people. Most live in northern Iraq, with smaller numbers in adjacent areas in northeastern Syria, southeastern Turkey, and northwestern Iran. The Chaldean Catholic Church is in full communion with the Bishop of Rome. Pro-family groups in Africa gathered this week in Nairobi for the African Regional Conference on Families to discuss the future of the family in Africa. The conference was a response to a growing concern that African children's innocence is being taken away by multiple United Nations agencies, federal and local governments, and school administrations, which are implementing comprehensive sexuality education as per a UNESCO agreement. These programs are intended to change sexual behavior in children by openly promoting promiscuity and high-risk sexual behavior, even among very young children. Topics at the conference included the pressure from the West to erode natural families, erosion of parenting responsibilities, the attack on the family by media, population control, and lethal family planning methods. It was co-hosted by World Congress of Families, the African Organization for Families, the Kenya Conference of Catholic Bishops, and the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection. The mission echoes the words of Pope St. John Paul II, who said, to overcome today's individualistic mentality, a concrete commitment to solidarity and charity is needed, beginning in the family. Coming up next, we'll go up close with the Howards, a family who hit the road in their RV with a message to help build more families into heroic families, with a message of healing and hope. We'll celebrate faith on the anniversary of the beatification of the first blessed of South Africa, a martyr killed in 1990 for his refusal to deny Christ. And we'll take a look at Rwanda, where during this Jubilee of Mercy, the Pan-African Congress on Divine Mercy has wrapped up, culminating with the consecration of the nation to God's divine mercy. Plus, we'll commemorate the 14th anniversary of the death of a cardinal who was imprisoned in his own country for 13 years and is now on the way to sainthood. Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. Jesus has the victory. We all have a call, a call to greatness a desire for it. We want to do something good. Now is your time. You could change the world, and the world needs changing, so get busy. Shalom World, God's own channel. More headline news. Music. It can express the movements of our hearts and has the power to uplift souls. And in the Archdiocese of Perth, Australia, one priest has done just that, with a song that tells the story of his priestly calling. It's titled, This Is What I've Always Wanted. You call me to you And I will follow Voice of the Vatican spoke to Father Mark Baumgarten about the inspiration behind the song. This was a, a song that I wrote shortly before my own uh, diaconate ordination. I was, um, uh, had a very uh, powerful period of prayer and when I was um, getting a real sense of affirmation from the Lord that uh, this ordination, I was getting a bit of uh, pre-ordination jitters, I guess, and uh, it's a real confirmation that this is where the Lord wanted me to be and, and kind of it translated into this song. Uh, I've written a few songs over the years, so there's something of a, of a way of journaling, I suppose, for me uh, in the past. And so uh, to try to capture significant moments, and this certainly was one. 
And the song, I guess, became something of a, of a mantra for myself in the lead up to ordination, a, a way of um, uh, reminding myself that this is indeed what God wanted me to do. And uh, so then, yeah, I'd played it for a few guys uh, since then, and uh, a number of them had said, oh, you should really do something with this song. Other guys might get something uh, out of it. And so then when I was given the vocations assignment, uh, there's sort of a chance to, to do something with the song. When the Archbishop of Perth, Timothy Costello, heard the song, he said it reminded him of his own discernment process and hoped it could be shared with others as a tool for discernment. We used the song to launch a, a website uh, for our vocations office back in, uh, in Perth, Australia. And uh, yeah, we got good feedback from, from the guys. A number of them sort of said that it's, you know, it's inspiring in them and to helping them to sort of be open to the Lord's call for their life. So that's what we're trying to do with it. We're hoping that um, it might, uh, you know, touch something off in people who are in that stage where I was perhaps a few years ago trying to figure out what the Lord's asking of them in their life. The song is meant to help listeners reflect on the beautiful movement of God in their own lives and to fully embrace the gift of vocation, whichever it may be. I guess this period of prayer that I'd had that inspired the song uh, it was just the Lord's way of telling me that it's okay, I've been with you through this all and I'm using all of these different steps and, and turns that your life took as a means of preparation for what I've got in, in store for you. And so I guess to uh, encourage uh, and, and to affirm others who are perhaps, you know, struggling in their own discerning and, and wondering, you know, if, if their life isn't, you know, doesn't seem like a straight line, but that God can still be working through that. Heroic families living out heroic virtue. The idea may sound fantastic, but the question is, how does a family get there? The Howard family is also seeking that answer and responded to a call from God to direct all their gifts and talents to helping families around the U.S. become heroic families by awakening, inspiring, and equipping families with messages of hope and healing. Voice of the Vatican spoke to Peter and Chantal Howard, parents of five who packed up their family and set off for eight months on the road, presenting leadership events at the service of ministering to the Christian family. Heroic Families is a response to the attack against the family today. Uh, its purpose is deeply personal to us because we've gone through a lot of challenges and trials in our marriage and in our family, and we realized that we're not alone, that there are many other families out there who are experiencing such trials. And they are hungering for purpose, for spiritual direction in their lives, for healing, healing is, is, a, is a major one. And also just they're hungering for an invitation to participate in a heroic way in the new evangelization. The purpose for heroic families is to set families free from the bondage of the world so that they can be leaders and innovators for the new evangelization. One of the things that has really inspired us is John Paul II's words where he says, it's time that the daily become heroic and the heroic become daily, which is one of the reasons why heroic families make so much sense because it is... Um, it's, it's just this, it's time for us to help families and equip families with the practical. How do you, you know, pray the rosary and live the life of the sacraments and, and, and incorporate the lofty theology of the church in the home? And how can we really make that tangible and practical and then go out? So, um, you know, I think that the time is right and I think that families are hungering and, and the church is ready to support families and in being involved in, in carrying that message. The Howards say that life on the road has had highs and lows, but always produced lots of fruit. Yeah, I think one of the big fruits of our ministry is simply that, that families uh, have the courage to talk about their challenges because we're willing to put ourselves out there. And so they can come to us and say, oh my goodness, I, you know, we were this perfect family from the outset and we had to hold our, our appearances for everybody. And you'd showed us that it's okay for us to be vulnerable and to encounter the patient mercy of God and be real about it. And so I think that's one of the beautiful things. And one young couple came to us and, and his words, we were eating a bowl of spaghetti together. And he just said, from the encounter of the event that we gave, he said, you straightened out our spaghetti. And I just loved that as an analogy, you know, his, and it was just beautiful. They, they chose to open themselves to life again. They chose to step out and begin to, to, you know, walk in the ways that the church highlights for us. And if that's one message we can share, um, you're not alone. There are families everywhere we go that are seeking 
to, to live what we desire to live as well. So it's just beautiful that the Holy Spirit is knitting us together as a family in a, in a Catholic sense. We all have an obligation to protect the family. Since as Pope John Paul II said, as the family goes, so goes the nation, and so goes the whole world in which we live. The one thing that we've really come away with is just understanding that our faith is our fuel. And that's what keeps us going. You can watch the full interview with Peter and Chantal Howard at shalomworldtv.org slash VOV. Exactly one year ago, the Universal Church celebrated the beatification of the first South African Blessed. He was a man of our times, martyred only in 1990. A school headmaster, Benedict Daswa, was beaten to death by villagers who attacked him after he refused to pay a sorcerer who promised to end destructive storms and lightning in the region. But instead, he spoke out against the practice. Voice of the Vatican spoke to Jola Zoliso Phyllis Makame, a marketing and communications specialist in South Africa, who attended the beatification of Blessed Benedict Daswa. He was a great educator involved in sports, involved for the youth and organizing the community, doing a whole lot of helpful things uh, for the community. And a strong family man, he had been involved even in building the church in that area. His convictions were strong and he, he remained in that way to his death. Um, he actually was saying a prayer when they killed him. First stoned by his assailants, Daswa ran to safety in a pub before being found by the mob and beaten to death. His murderers then poured boiling water into his open wounds, ears, and nostrils to make sure he was dead. His courage of faith began to spread throughout the local Catholic community. Until last September 20th, Cardinal Angelo Amato, Prefect of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, officially declared him blessed on the behalf of Pope Francis. Sub-Saharan Africa is home to a rapidly growing Catholic membership of 171 million people, representing 16% of the Catholic population around the world, according to a 2013 study by the Pew Research Center. On his trip to Africa in 2015, Pope Francis encouraged the Christian community to persevere in its witness of faith and charity, and thus to be a leaven of hope for society as a whole. The Pan-African Congress on Divine Mercy has concluded in the Rwandese town of Kabuga at the Shrine of Divine Mercy, with a mass presided over by the special envoy of Pope Francis to the Congress, Cardinal Laurent Mosenwego Pasinha. The Triumph of the Cross Mass concluded with a solemn act of consecration of the African continent to Divine Mercy. Rwanda is a country with fresh memories of human destruction in the genocide of 1994. The consecration, which raises something to a permanent state, calls for the very mercy which the Church is celebrating during this Jubilee year. The theme of the conference, Divine Mercy, a source of hope for the new evangelization in Africa, noted that the Church is at the forefront in encouraging forgiveness, healing, and reconciliation in the wounded country. This is the same message that the Second African Synod fostered in 2009, when the African Church pledged to be at the service of reconciliation. Mercy is the formula to perfection, and its practice a way that the faithful can imitate Christ, who in John 13 called all to love one another as he does. In Rome, Cardinal Peter Turkson, the president of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, celebrated a mass especially for the local Vietnamese community in commemoration of the 14th anniversary of the death of Cardinal Francois Nguyen Van Thuan. Cardinal Van Thuan is entombed in the Church of Santa Maria della Scala in Rome, and in his homily, Cardinal Turkson recalled the 13 years Cardinal Van Thuan spent in prison in Vietnam nine of them in solitary confinement in Hanoi. This was shortly following his appointment as coadjutor bishop of Saigon, which came only seven days before South Vietnam fell to the communist north in 1975. While imprisoned, the bishop wrote daily notes to his flock, which were smuggled out of the jail, revealing profound messages of love and hope. His spiritual testimony from prison has been collected in the book, The Road of Hope. 
He was released from prison in 1988, and Pope John Paul II called him to Rome, where he eventually became president of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace until his death in 2002. Voice of the Vatican spoke to Dr. Luisa Melo, a former colleague of Cardinal Van Thuan at the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, who is now promoting the cause for his beatification. She's also the author of a book about the Cardinal titled Man of Hope, Charity, and Joy. The Cardinal touched many people's hearts. My heart was moved by his simplicity, his devotion, and especially by his humility. He was a very gentle and peaceful person. In prison, he spent many months in an extreme narrow space without windows, half suffocated by the heat and humidity. Often, he had great difficulty in breathing. They tortured him by leaving him under light day and night for ten days, and then depriving him of all light for long periods. One day, in the darkness, he noticed a tiny hole through which the light shone. From then on, he used to put his nostril there to breathe more easily. And even though he suffered a lot, he never complained about his conditions. On the contrary, he was always smiling. He used to come by here, by each of our offices, and say to us with sincerity, Good morning, how are you? He lived a good life, but always in simplicity. Whether he was with a person of power or ministering to a beggar on the street, he was prayerful. He always lived in the present. He was devoted to the Virgin Mary and to his people. This is what helped him to go beyond his pain. Colonel Van Thuan is an authentic example of steadfast faith and a man who understood the power of prayer, saying, In moments of great suffering, sometimes when I wanted to pray, I could not. I was desperately tired, sick, and hungry. Often I was tempted to despair and rebellion. But the Lord always helped me. Prayer saved my life. All week long, you can keep up with the latest happenings in Rome on our Twitter feed, which is at Voice of Vatican. And be sure to like us on Facebook on our Voice of the Vatican page. Keep checking our social media feeds for breaking news and information about upcoming guests and features. And we want to hear your voice too. Email your questions and stories to us at vov at shalomworld.org. I'm Ashley Nerona, and on behalf of the entire staff and crew of Voice of the Vatican, I wish you a blessed week. May God bless you and your family. Saying ciao for now from the Eternal City, I'll see you right here next week on Voice of the Vatican, only on Shalom World TV, bringing Rome to your home.